his left leg under a boulder the size of an aga cooker. Not just broken, but kind of severed the leg, completely trapped, and had been in that state for the past five hours. Nobody knows we're in China. Do we stay here until he dies? Uh, but he could be alive for days. Do we cut the bottom of the leg off in order to free him? But he'd bleed to death. I know it sounds dramatic, but you know, it guy's under the boulder. I'm David Bond. I'm here in the studio with Julian Freeman Atwood. And I love this description of you, Jules, that you're one of the last great Edwardian adventurers. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> you tend to keep pretty quiet about your adventures. This one happened 30 years ago. There's not much out there about it. Why are we here today? Why have you decided that it's time to talk about this extraordinary rescue? Well, I've been rather prompted by the recent death of my old friend, the American climber, Ed Webster. Um, and it was he uh, and Lindsay Griffin uh, who made up the climbing party involved in this story. I had talked to Ed a great deal about uh, this particular rescue over many, many years, and he was going to put something down and never did. So it needed telling in its own right, but it's in remembrance of him as well. Yes. It happened in 1992, the actual year that Mongolia received its independence from, from the former uh, USSR. I had met Lindsay Griffin uh, on an 8,000-metre peak called Shisha Pangma in Tibet in 1987, along with the climber Stephen Venables. Uh, the, the money for that, and it was considerable, was, was, was got together by John Blashford Snell, who had started up Operation Rally. Then uh, Venables, the next year, as it happened, became the first Brit to climb um, Everest without supplementary oxygen. And him and I did another expedition with Lindsay, to the uh, sub-Antarctic islands of South Georgia in 1989. And yet again, John Blasher Snell helped us with contacts in the Navy so that the HMS Endurance dropped us there. In 1991, I then met Ed Webster, who, who had been with Venables on Everest. Credibly well-known American climber put up one of the most famous rock climbs in Utah, the Supercrack. So he was very active in the 70s as, as a rock climber. And... I was approached by John Blasher Sargas. They were doing a sort of a rally international thing to Mongolia a few months after uh, independence. John wanted us to sort of do some guiding of some of what he calls the venturers. Well, I mean, I'm not certainly not a guide, so he, um, but Lindsay had done some guiding, and we thought, well, we, we could take these... Um, uh, Venturers, as they're called, on some easy peaks. And I said, well, but would you give us time, the three of us, to do some other climbing sort of halfway through this expedition? Give us a sense of the remoteness of the region that we're talking about here. OK, the very far northwest corner of Mongolia are the Altai Mountains. And it's where four borders come together. You've got Mongolia and western China, and you've got Russia and Kazakhstan. And it's, I think, the furthest bit of land away from any sea on the planet. It's very Central Asia. It's a long way from Ulaanbaatar. The capital is sort of Central East. And the Operation Rally was to be uh, stationed at a town called Hovd. And Hovd, even the Mongolians in Ulaanbaatar, call it their Wild West. So where did you fly into initially? Flew initially into Ulaanbaatar. Quite a few trucks for the Operation Rally went, went across the Gobi Desert. It was 800 miles to Hovd. We flew in an ageing Russian biplane, stopping occasionally to pick up fuel. I will say that before we left Britain, we were trying to find out what climbing had ever been done in the Altai. And the only thing we could find was a sketch map done by some Polish climbers in 1967, made by this guy, Richard Palczewski. But it was all in Polish, so we didn't really know what had actually been done or not, and we wanted to do stuff that they hadn't done. The mount, the highest peak, called Wheaton, had been climbed in 1956, easy route from the Mongolian side on a sort of Mongolian-Russian expedition. But the Poles did quite a bit more in 67. Um, we couldn't get hold of, uh, of Richard and didn't know where to find him. When we got to Hov, we were camping outside the small desert town. And just before going up country to the Altai, this affable and bearded man walked in, literally 
half an hour after Lindsay had said, God, I wonder if anyone speaks Polish around here. And Richard walks into the tent, not only speaks po- Polish, but he actually wrote the map. And he happened to turn up that very day, 25 years after he had last been there. And that's when he said, you know what you guys ought to do? You ought to go down onto the Przewalski Glacier, uh, named after Count Przewalski and the Przewalski Horse. And, um, which is, but it's the China side. It's, it would be an illegal over the range, but that's where all the unclimbed stuff is. It's so remote, even on the Chinese side. No one had been onto the Przewalski before that we know. Um, and I'm not even sure that there might have been a science trip there, but no climbers have been there in the last 30 years either, uh, not least because it's the part of Western China that's now the Uyghur area. So, of course, it's, it's always been difficult, but it more so now it would have been impossible mm-hmm. to go there. So anyway, we took a truck up country for the 150 miles to to the last um, village on the Mongolian side of the range, having passed through, and this comes into the story later, um, a, a town called Olgi, which is a, 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 it's kind of largely Kazakh. It's, it's in Mongolia, but it's a Kazakh area and was quite a big coal mining area, middle of the desert, you can imagine, not, not your normal coal mine. but um, And that comes into our story, but that was the only... Uh, place pretty well deserted because after the uh, after Mongolia got its independence and the breakup of the uh, of the former USSR, a lot of the Kazakh people in Mongolia were going back to Kazakhstan to family in Kazakhstan. So it was becoming. I think if you were going to make a a film of a sort of post Holocaust town, you'd use Olgi. So there's another hundred miles of of, of dirt track till you get to. Uh, what we termed as our base camp in Mongolia. To get stuff from the last town up there, it's basically camels that you're loading and you're riding step ponies and towing laden camels. And I have to say, they are the most extraordinarily strong and versatile animal. But you don't think of camels as being things that walk up a glacier. But they do. And uh, that's what you use to get to, to the base camp. And on the way there, it snowed quite a bit. And there really were bits. Let me try to paint this picture. It's really like a sort of boggy bit of Scotland with the Alps behind and with a camel in it. <laughs> and I had actually bought a, 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 a yurt. Actually, they're called a ger in G-E-R in Mongolia as a base tent for everybody because we were going to have joining us the first group of half a dozen of the Operation Rally or Rally International Venturers to take climbing. And so it was a good place to live. They'd be intense, but it's a good place to cook in and um, a stove up there and collected uh, yak dung, sheep dung and whatever to burn. So you've got Ed Webster and Lindsay uh, we got uh, Naran, who was an interpreter, a guy called Colonel Sanjid, who was from the uh, Mongolian army, but he retired from the army, um, didn't speak a word of English, and th- th- that's, that's another bit of the story. So there were just the five of us there. And then when these first venturers came, I went back down. So I did, I did uh, two or three trips up from the roadhead to, to the base camp. It was rather a good range to do things with with those who hadn't done much before but were very willing because there were quite a lot of easy routes to do on unclimbed peaks. Ultimately, we climbed something like 24, 25 peaks between three and a half thousand and four and a half thousand meters, of which probably half were first ascents. So we took them on some, you know, for them, you haven't done any climbing before and you're in Mongolia and you're 20 years old. They, they, I think they, they did quite well. And you're on uncharted territory and with done. three nutters. <laughs> um, at that stage, me and Ed and Lindsay set off with uh, a week's worth of food, gas and climbing gear of horribly big loads, which I couldn't possibly carry now, um, across the Potanina Glacier and into onto the the glacier flowing in opposite side of that of the Potanina called the Alexandrov. The only person who was going to at that stage be left at base camp was Colonel Sanjit, who would be on his own. Um, and we had seen on one of the previous ascents, the previous ten days, uh, 
uh, we, we could see the south ridge of the highest peak, Wheaton, stretching down with a couple of hard sections down onto the Przewalski Glacier, itself about 15 miles long, and you could see that snaking on down to a tiny bit of green in the distance of, 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 uh, of um, Chinese Xinjiang province. So we needed to get down onto the Przewalski, and we, we got up to the top of the Alexandrov um, and put a camp up there, and the next morning, we woke up before going down into China, um, and there were some extraordinary tracks right across the head of the Alexandrov. Some very large footprints in strange sets of three. And the only thing that could make anything that large would be a, a brown bear, but it went only 25 meters from our tent in the middle of the night. Of course, we called the Col Yeti Col because these tracks went themselves over into China and down onto the Przewalski. So we followed, as it were, the Yeti tracks. By the way, the Mongols call their Yeti the Almas. So their, their strange ape-like thing is that. But no, it, it was quite, quite strange prints. Um, could have been an injured bear. But a, a, an interesting thing to wake up to. It would have been a, 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 a great shot. I'm glad he didn't come nosing around our tent. So we headed off down uh, uh, over the coal. We took three or four hours going down and down climbing, uh, I suppose, a couple of thousand feet down this quite narrow coal uh, a, a gully going down onto the top of the Przewalski. And, yeah, it, it's quite thrilling when you are, you know, you're the first to tread on. It, it might sound like, you know, who cares, but it doesn't feel like that when you're doing it. We then had to cross the upper Przewalski, and there was quite a lot of crevasses. Not actually very big ones, but ones you quite often fell up to your waist in and got wedged. And that happened to me three or four times. So it's an exhausting business with a huge rucksack. Kind of the others would have to, or, or whichever one of us would fall into these things, you need the other two to pull them out, and, unless you were going to take your rucksack off and make a big fuss of it. But we eventually, after, um, I suppose, the rest of that day, really, it was afternoon by the time we got to the far side of the Przewalski Glacier, that's on the side that the highest peak, Mount Wheaton, is, and found a place to put our uh, two tents up, uh, a two-man and a one-man tent, um, and hunkered down there, and then there was some pretty bad weather for that day. We did a bit of a reconnaissance the next day to the uh, base of the south ridge of the mountain, the, the, the ridge we had our eyes on, um, uh, and came back to our, uh, let's call it our Chinese base, and decided to get off at midnight coming up. Uh, while everything is frozen in place. The weather, by the way, was now brilliant, starry night. Yeah, I mean, we were expecting to get up and down it in, 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 in a, uh, probably 18 or 20 hours, maybe less. We started off with head torches and with nothing else except some water, because it was a day thing, really, or a long day thing, um, and, and some chocolate and some biscuits. I mean, that's the way you do it. And rope and some climbing gear and ice screws and um, try to get up this thing. The beginning of the ridge, the whole of the ridge, both sides, is a sort of really nasty jumble of large boulders. Now, big boulder fields at a sort of quite steep angle, by which I mean sort of 45 degrees, would look to any non-mountaineer, you can get up it. You can get anyone off the street and here they get. But they're pretty dangerous because you, you, you tread on these boulders. Anyone would tell you you've been to the Himalaya or anything. You tread on something and there's this great clunk, clunk where a, a, a boulder uh, weighing half a ton actually slightly moves and it's, it's quite nerve-wracking. Um, but not technical. So when we got up to going into the ice ridge... It's not at that particular stage particularly steep, but there's big drops off each side. That got us up to 
as it was breaking dawn to quite a narrow section. It was a traverse on 70 degree, little bit of snow over water ice. And then it kind of opened up more. Um, this was probably by nine o'clock this morning, so we've been going about nine hours. It, it, it opened up into a broader ridge with incredible views across the Prishavalsky south into China, south and west into China. And I got to the top of Wheaton, which is 4,500 4, metres, something like that, um, at about midday and looked along this fairly flat summit ridge to the if you like the Mongolian summit because it's like it's two summits and it looked like we weren't sure whether it was higher or lower it looked a bit higher so we went along there it took 20 minutes to go along but it was a lovely day we were just walking along the ridge of this peak it was just a wonderful day when we actually got there, our, our altimeter said it was marginally lower, and then you looked back, and you in, and where we had come from looked higher, and then started descending at about half past one, and got down back across the difficult constriction, uh, just above then this enormous one thousand eight hundred foot of boulder slope, which was on all sides of the ridge, west, east, and straight down. So really, no option. You had to go through it. You had to go through it. Well. Actually, Ed didn't. Now, this was at the point where, with the benefit of hindsight, but that's climbers for you, we actually split up. And I thought, you know, there was a discussion about which way to go down, whether there'd be an easier way down than the one we came up. And I thought there probably wasn't. You might have just retreat one step. So, I mean, we're not going to know where we are anyway in that boulder field, and you'll just end up somewhere at the toe of the ridge. But you just um, So I decided to go down that way, the way we had come. Um, as we're looking south down that ridge, to the right is to the west, and that's a boulder slope that Lindsay decided to go down, or said he was going down. And then slightly further to the right, Ed saw a bit of a gully. He thought he could glissade down. Now, glissading is when you sort of sit on your bum and slide down something and control yourself with an ice axe. And it can be a very effective way of getting down very quickly if things go well. Um, so, yeah, so you could say, foolish us, we all split up. But, but relations were good, this was just doing oh, yeah. it. You weren't, having a, you weren't having a row. Oh, God, no. No, 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 no it was just sort of just, individualism. Just it was ridiculous. <laughs> difference of opinion. <laughs> we didn't think about it. You know, we didn't no. think it was much. You know, it was no day. You know, you it is some boulders. Yes. You thought you were through the tough stuff. Yeah, exactly. So it's some boulders, but, you know, see you at base camp. That was that was the job. Uh, I wouldn't do it now because I realised how dangerous boulder slopes are. But off I went and got down to um, our Chinese base camp at about four in the afternoon. And then about half an hour later, Ed turned up. And he had actually, well, he'd had a bit of a funny time because he had done a bit of a glissade into a, a, a small gully and had gone out of control on what he thought was snow but was water ice underneath and had taken quite a slide into some boulders. I mean, he had just bruised himself, but he was a bit, oh, got to be careful here. Got into a bigger gully and got down that, but it was slightly dodgy for a completely different reason. Got to the west side of the ridge and came around the toe of it and back to our Chinese base camp. And an hour later, hmm, where's Lindsay? Oh, he's probably gone to climb another little peak somewhere or, you know, because, you, you, you know, Lindsay is like that and he's been doing an incredible amount of mountaineering all his life. I popped out for about 40 minutes to see if I could, and shouted at the toe of the ridge to see if I could find him, and I couldn't, and came back to the tent at which point Ed was up and we were both worried. So it was now six in the evening and we set off then only with a, a, a couple of axes, um, not without a rope. Um, we didn't have anything with us really because we, did, we were just going to try to find Lindsay. Um, 
but it was just starting to feel not very good. Um, so we went right round the toe of the South Ridge and up about 500 foot onto a, a, a level area which was below the west face and looked up for 1,800 feet up this great big boulder slope um, and had no idea where he was. But we did have an idea of where he had intimated he was going to come down when we split up. So we shouted and yelled, Griffin, Lindsay, um, and nothing. So we decided we've got to go up because there's no way. We, we, we looked with some binoculars on our way around. He wasn't coming down the way I did, and you could see, you know, all the facets of the ridge. We're pretty sure we'd see him uh, if, if, if he was on his way down. Um, at, and we climbed up maybe another 500 feet. And there was a little bit of an evening wind coming up, which wasn't going to help us shouting and getting him to hear us. And we yelled and shouted and yelled and shouted again. And finally, um, when we were kind of despairing, we heard from way up another 1,000 feet above us this just... We could just hear it on the wind, this scream and yell, which meant big trouble. You just knew. It. There was no way that that was going to not be trouble. So we were pretty sure he was in some distress. Um, so we carried on. You know, we climbed the bloody mountain up and down, and, and then now we were climbing it a second time. Um, and went up another 500 foot, yelled and screamed for him, no reply. So we just didn't know. You didn't know whether he's further to the right, further to the left. But we got up then to what turned out to be not probably slightly above his level and shouted again and then got a call over to the left and slightly below us. So we were, you know, we were homing in on him and eventually found him at um, at about eight o'clock in the evening, nine o'clock in the evening. And I was really shocked to what we saw because there was Lindsay, his left leg, under a boulder the size of an agar cooker, um, completely trapped and had been in that state for the past five hours, um, not necessarily thinking anyone was ever going to find him. I mean, he would have known that we were going to be looking, but it was, you know, it was a particularly horribly nasty position to be in. And remember, you know, we are, nobody knows we're in China, on the wrong side of Mongolia, let alone, you know, it's remote enough in Mongolia, the whole thing couldn't, you know, it could not be worse. And you were at the top of a, nearly near the top of a, you know, a boulder field that's hard enough to get through oh, when, yes. when, you're at, when you're moving. When you're moving. Well, this is what had happened. He had been down climbing. He had dislodged a boulder, easy done, nothing he did wrong, um, which, had, which, had, which had set off a kind of localised boulder avalanche, which meant him going almost head over heels and landing then this boulder on top with his leg in a, in a, in a gap between two other boulders and the big boulder kind of slightly V-shaped. And it had basically, without actually taking out the arteries, had basically not just broken but kind of severed the leg about uh, four inches above the ankle, five inches above the ankle. I mean, it was... We couldn't really see exactly because he had a climbing boot on, plastic climbing boot. It was well, being Lindsay. He, he he. It is remarkable what he had done during that five hours. He had in his rucksack a rope, the only rope we had taken with us, which for the climb. Um, he then uh, had heroically uh, lassoed a, a rock higher than where he was lying and made something of a pulley system by going back to another rock. And he had, he had succeeded probably of slightly lessening the pressure on the leg through this rope pulley system. I mean, he had a few Temjizik painkillers, 
but not many. I think he'd been going in and out of consciousness and was plainly very good, uh, p- pleased to see us. <laughs> I but, bet he was pleased to see you. Uh, but uh, j- just when we found... I found him first. I mean, I was 20 yards ahead of Ed, and I, uh, you know, I said, Lindsay, we're here, it's OK. Um, but I just popped back to 20 yards to Ed out of earshot, said, Ed, we've got serious problems here. This is not going to be an easy one to get him out from under this boulder. First, you're putting ice axe in there and trying to lever something. And every time you did that, it kind of tended to... The, the pointed bit of the rock tended to push into Lindsay, and he was just yelling, saying, no, 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 you've got to stop, 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 because what couldn't happen in any event is if he were to become unconscious, that would that would not be good, because... You know, it, it, obviously for his sake, but but uh, he needed to to be able to use his arms or whatever if we were ever going to get him down from here. We levered uh, as much as we could, and I put my arm in. I was thinking, God, I hope the, the boulder doesn't move now, to get some smaller stones from around his foot to try and get some space. Um, but... The long and short of it is we just hadn't got anywhere in, in, in two hours. We, we were not going to get him out. And at that stage, it was really, really horrible because you'd think, I mean, and, and I didn't allow myself to think of it for long, but realistically, what, 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 you know, do we stay here until he dies with him? I mean, you wouldn't leave him. Uh, but he could be alive for days and days. I mean, what, what on earth do you do? You know, do we... Uh, do we cut the bottom of the leg off in order to free him? But he'd bleed to death. I mean, you know, I know it sounds dramatic, but this is what, you know, the guy's under the boulder. We'd have to stay with him. That's the only thing you'd have to do till uh, when you're going to keep, keep feeding. I mean, it, it, it doesn't bear thinking about, it, really. So we redoubled our efforts and uh, to sit around thinking about that. Um, and then Ed said, OK, let's change this pulley system. We get a rock higher up at a different angle, and we did a six-to-one pulley system with carabiners. And with him hauling on that, but we were, what we had to be sure of is the pulley system wasn't then going to pull the higher boulder down on us. But um, we did the pulley system uh, of him pulling like mad and me levering the boulder. And that because of the new angle, did move it without further squashing Lindsay's leg, and we, we, we got an inch out of it. And I then hammered in some chalk stones. Um, and then we did that again and got another inch out of it. Uh, and I think a third time, this was over perhaps another half an hour, we, I think, probably just went as far as we could with that. I mean, there was no way, the way the boulder was, that it was going to move any more. But we reckoned it was just enough, perhaps, if we... So, with the ice axes and breaking up smaller bits of stone, we just got enough space around this constriction and then had to get hold of... uh, try to get hold of his leg below the break so that we weren't leaving it behind when we pulled him out because he had a plastic boot on. We couldn't get the boot off. Um got hold of it and with uh, Ed uh, pulling under his arms and him screaming his head off um, we did get him out from under the boulder but as we did so I let go and, and the bottom of the the leg kind of flopped to one side and you know I think it was a horrific thing for Lindsay to see of his own Leg. I mean, it was awful for him. Poor, you know, he was amazing. I mean, he was so stalwart. But we had got him out, so he wasn't. He wasn't going to perish there. We we could do something now, but it was dark, and it had got to probably, I suppose, I suppose it was ten ten o'clock. So we've been going sort of twenty two hours now. So the next thing to do was to splint the, the leg. We couldn't do anything else. So we put two ice axes, one each side, and used most of the climb, probably at least half the climbing rope, 
going around. So at least we have the thing in line. And we're pretty sure that, 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 that we, we weren't going to be moving the leg too much one bit and the other in relation to because that's what really is painful. So then we said, we've well, we, we got to start down. Ed would get under his armpits. So you're going to have to lever him down from one boulder to the next, two or three foot, a couple of foot, two and a half foot, down onto the next boulder, down onto the next boulder. So you have to lift him up under the arms. And then the one of us who was by a leg would hold a hand either side of the brake to try with, with your elbows in so that to try to keep it dead straight without moving it left and right. Do you see what I mean? And so, and without falling over to, to, to do that bit. And then now we've got 1,800 feet to, to do this. It's going to take a very, very long time of one, you know, on, on, on. And we went on like that for the next four hours till we were about halfway down the face. Um, now, then we had a break, and I said to Ed, look, Ed, let's just look further down the road on this. We'll get Lindsay down to the nearest flat point, which is at the bottom of this face, at some stage. Um, but we can't get him down another, onto the Prizovalsky. We can't get him ourselves over, back over Yeti Col, over the range, and down the Alexandrov Glacier, and across the Potanina Glacier. This is not possible. We need, we need some help. Um, so... And if we're going to go and get some help, which we're going to have to do, because there's no communications, we don't have any communications, um, I or you individually can't go back across the glaciers with the crevasses, because if, 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 if that happens, you won't, neither of us will know the others perished in a crevasse. We're going to both have to go to be roped up. We both know where Lindsay is. We're going to have to leave him. Might sound... Not the right, but the, 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 the wrong thing to do would be to have one of us to have gone across the glacier. There was no doubt about it in my mind. Anyway, I made that decision. And, I mean, I made that decision. We both made that decision. Um, and so I thought to, to, to facilitate that, if there was a bit of a rhythm going, so we were more than halfway down the face. If I said to Ed, look, if you're happy, because Lindsay could use his own arms... Ed could take the leg. Are you okay together to make a bit of progress? I'll go down to the bottom of the face, on down to the glacier, back round to our base camp, pick up Lindsay's tent, sleeping bag, all the food we've got, gas, spare clothing, big load, and bring it back round because, you know, if we can leave him with all that, he's going to be fine, except he's going to be in a great deal of pain. And the leg going bad was the worst thing. But he's not going to uh, leave him by water. He, he'll be fine. He's got water. Thing. Not a nice place to be, being left on your own or anything. But, but it should be OK. I can't think of a better plan in any event. So off I went down more boulders, which isn't really like, onto the Prezhevalsky, got back to the camp and, and, and loaded up all, all what I've said into a rucksack, great big heavy sack, made one cup of tea and... Um, Actually, I felt rather, rather guilty, the fact that I, I went to sleep for 30 minutes. But when I said that to Ed, he said, don't worry, I went to sleep for 30 minutes as well. <laughs> um, and made it back just as dawn was coming with this sack right up to, the, to this flat bit of ground and found a little stream, rivulet, um, coming through some little bit of sort of grassy meadow bit um, where... Uh, we were going to leave the tent with Lindsay in it. Uh, looking up to see where they were, I was I was surprised by how little progress compared to the face that they had done. And they'd been at it and at it and at it. I mean, God, Ed had done a sterling job uh, and, and Lindsay a sterling job of helping himself. Um, but I actually I didn't put the tent up to start with. I made a, made tea for them and had some biscuits, and I then went back up to them. They were probably three or four hundred foot up, and gave them tea and biscuits, and then helped them down. And that was about by then it was about 
three o'clock in the afternoon. So he put the tent up. Well, the first thing to do was then to take the ice axes off, try and get his plastic boots off, which is a pretty difficult thing to do without it being excruciatingly painful. He, all the painkillers are gone. In any event, we took the boot off, uh, um, made him as comfortable as possible, re-splinted it more lightly, and got him into the sleeping bag in the tent. Uh, with his head near the entrance, he could reach to this rivulet of water for water, at the stove there, food, uh, weather was still good. And um, it was a pretty terrible moment where we, where we walked off and waved goodbye to Lindsay and left him there in the middle of nowhere, in that state. Um, poor man, I mean, God. Um, and the plan was that we would get back to Mongolia and, and get some people up to come and do a land party. So Ed and me then left um, and got back to our Chinese uh, camp. And just as it was getting dark and with head torches, we set off over the, to go over the range. Um, initially setting off across the upper Prezhevalsky Glacier towards the col that leads up to what we called Yeti Col. That was impossible. It was quite crevassed, as I'd said, uh, that we had found on the way over. So I went up a side glacier below a peak called Selengi, which we had, which was on the border, which we had before made a first made an ascent of. Um, went up as you're looking up it, the right hand side of it, so its true left bank. Found that impossible. Went had to go back down a bit and across and up its true right bank, i.e., as we were looking at it and going up on the left hand side and really exhausted, right to the top of that glacier, and then uh, up about a 50-degree snow and ice slope for about a 1,000 feet to the, to the ridge, which was the frontier. Um, and then it was too steep there. We did an abseil, quite a long abseil, onto, but it only required the one, but then quite a lot of down climbing facing in. And it was... Uh, not far off dawn by the time we got onto the Alexandrov Glacier and zombified uh, walked down the Alexandrov Glacier across the Potanina and arrived at the Mongolian base camp where there was only Colonel Sanjid. And he didn't speak a word of English, but he understood something was pretty wrong pretty quickly. That was then 51 hours on the go. Um, from starting the ascent at mid midnight that night. Um, so we were sort of semi-hallucinating. I mean, we got there actually about 4.30 in the morning and I knew that we, if we were going to do any radio calls, but they were always at 7. So um, we really wanted the radio to work that morning. Wound it up at 7 o'clock and got through. I spoke to... John Blashford Snell and said that. Bit of a problem with Lindsay, John. Oh, where is he? Um, well, he's in China. Uh, so John was fairly unfazed by that. So the first thing to do was to send four of the venturers and, and, and one of the staff up who had already been with us. Um, or some who'd already been with us and some other strong lads. Uh, and they immediately came up by road that day uh, to arrive the next morning, which was remarkable. And in order to get Lindsay back, I thought the only thing we can do is make a bit of a sledge, because tying him to that and dragging him was the only way we were going to do it without causing incredible grief to him. But we didn't have a sledge, so we had to... So the poles of a, of a yurt or a girl, if you imagine you've got the vertical poles on the side and they, they bend in to come up onto the apex. So if you took two or three of those, or as you take, did four of those poles and turned them upwards, you've got like a sledge with the runners going up in the front. And with um, snow stakes going across and lots of climbing rope and all the rest of it, we made a pretty good, well, good as we could sledge. At this stage, John said he was trying to get some kind of a helicopter, but this is Mongolia, newly independent. The Russians had moved out and anything that wasn't bolted down was nicked. 
I mean, it was left with nothing, Mongolia. Very short of fuel. We knew that already. I mean, it was extremely short of fuel. And the nearest helicopter, anyway, was uh, about a thousand miles away in Bulan Bato. We never reckoned that would come, but John was working on it. Um, and these guys came up, so that day, and he said, oh, yes, we, we, can, we, we can get a helicopter, we can get a helicopter. So, and then it was going to come at two o'clock and nothing happened at four. I, I said, look, we've got to go. We cannot wait any longer. So the Ed and me and, the, and four, there were six of us, started off across the first hundred yards of the Potanina Glacier when we heard some rotors going. Because um, I'm just saying, once you were out of earshot and beyond, there's no calling you back, is there? So yeah. it's incredibly lucky that it came at that moment. Yes, it was. And the story of it is extraordinary because it's by no means an easy thing. Ex-Mongolian uh, RAF pilot, uh, Captain Jambledorge, and uh, he managed to get... So, so an ancient MI8 a 25-year-old Russian helicopter, which when Ed saw it, called it the school bus, had virtually no fuel. He had enough to fly across the Gobi for 800 miles from Ulaanbaatar to Hovd. Um, when he dropped down at Hovd, he um, needed more fuel. When John Blashford Snell had to find the regional governor, to, to release some, some sort of state reserves for this helicopter. And there was a, a, a dump of fuel just out of town, but the, some nomad literally had the keys to the dump and had to first be found. So there was a delay while some horsemen went to find this guy with the keys in order to release the fuel, which was in drums, and had to be brought back and tipped into the helicopter. And the amount of fuel that there was available was, was enough probably to get to the mountains, but not all the way back. So Jambledorge went off. At this stage, there was a doctor from the op rally, plus one other, um, Jan Kennis and George Baber, who, who were in the, in the helicopter. And they flew. It was difficult for them to find where they were going. They, they were trying to find Olgi, which was the town I described as being the post-Holocaust town, but they missed it altogether. But they could see another 100 miles on the right snow caps of the Altai Mountains. Um, but when he got to our base camp, he was pretty preciously short of fuel. Um, so we decided it, uh, one of us had to stay in Mongolia. There was no point in me and Ed going because there was the doctor there and we needed, if anything happened to this helicopter or it crash landed or had to land and couldn't take off again or whatever, we had to have one person knowing where, where Lindsay was rather than... so. And I kind of... I stayed at base camp and I wish I hadn't because that was, as you will hear, the, probably the worst time in my life in terms of anxiety. So it arrives at base camp. You, yeah. you, you decide you're going to stay put so that there's yep. the, font, uh, the font of knowledge is there just in case something goes wrong. And well, then at this point, how, how... I mean, he's already incredibly low on fuel. Running out of fuel up there is... That's it? He's not going to allow that to happen, but I, but I tell you, it, 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 it's very dodgy. He might be able to get back. He certainly can't get further back than Olgi. He might, you know, be dodgy at base camp. But he goes off... Um, what a man this Jambledorge is, and flies around the highest peak o over the north side with Ed telling him where to go, and they fly down around the north side of, 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 of Wheaton, and Ed shows him where Lindsay is in his tent on the flat bit of ground. They try to land. You've got to remember this helicopter doesn't have much of an altitude ceiling. It needs to keep going at 4,000 metres. It's not that happy at 3,500 metres. It's OK. But when they're going round to try to land at Lindsay's for the first time, I mean, they nearly foul up. Apparently, the, the rotors were, were literally five or six feet away from the rocks. And the, Ed says he could tell that they were in a fluster at that point, that, you know, that they nearly fouled it up there, and therefore weren't prepared to try to land at that point again, and went down 500 foot onto the Prudzhevalsky Glacier, where we had walked around when we left Lindsay. Um, 
and dropped out um, uh, George Baber, Jan Kennis, the doctor, and Ed to go and secure Lindsay. And so they had to go up this 500-foot thing. They, the, the, the medical box was... It was so quickly this happening, Ed told me the medical box that get le- got left on the helicopter. But they hurried on to Lindsay and the helicopter disappeared. And they were so concerned with getting to Lindsay, they, they didn't kind of notice which way it had gone. But it went. And they found Lindsay, got the tent down, got him, I mean, it not matter about the tent, but got him out of it, got him ready. I think they had a stretcher with them. And they waited there, and another hour went past. And another hour went past. And, of course, I'm on the Mongolian side now. I, I think this whole thing is going to take 45 minutes to an hour. Two hours later, I'm in a, a, a real state. Because... If anything happens to that helicopter, there are then there's then Lindsay um, and and five others, i.e. six people in total, um, either injured or they're okay, but the helicopter isn't. And uh, yes, they've got Ed there, but I mean, it's a nightmare. Can you imagine? It's a nightmare of a situation. Um, and then it goes to three hours, and they still haven't come. So I've decided. They, the, the helicopter's not coming back. It's gone down. I'm going to have we to go. We have to now, at the beginning of the night, with these four youngsters who've never really climbed or gone over anything before, but, you know, we've got crampons for them, and I'm going to have to go over with them, without Ed, back into China to see what on earth's happened, and at least find Lindsay. Uh, so, back in China, what... Captain Jambledore just done is he's realised that helicopter's too heavy and they're so short of fuel. So he f- simply flew further into China down the Przewalski Glacier for about 15 miles to the nearest bit of flat, flat ground at about 2,500 metres and turned off the chopper, which is quite dodgy. You've got to reckon there's definitely a restart here. Turned it off. He waited... Uh, actually, there was some quite bad weather came through. So he was waiting for this bad weather to go through. So he was obviously amazingly sort of calm in a way. He probably wasn't. Um, and he must have known he was in China, but didn't really care. Um, and then he decided when it was time to go to pick Lindsay up that he was ready to be picked up. He started the helicopter, took most of the seats out, anything that wasn't bolted down got thrown out. And he took all six lead-acid batteries out to lighten the load. Because it started, you don't need the batteries because uh, it's got its own generator, so that doesn't harm the thing. You, 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 but you still got to undo them, and they're big, heavy batteries left on the side of the glacier. And he flies up the Przewalski lighter so that he's able now, in a kind of rolling landing fashion, to, to in some snow and boulders, to land within sort of 25, 30 yards from from Lindsay. Um, And is yelling, the co-pilot guy is yelling, right, uh, you've got like one minute to get in here and the chopper's going and it's, you know, it's madness. And in that madness, as they are shoving Lindsay in the stretcher into the helicopter, Ed falls over and Lindsay is kind of dropped out of the, 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 the stretcher sort of onto boulders. I mean, it's just, he's yelling in agony. Oh, God, poor Lindsay. Um, and, uh, but finally, they just have to, uh, they kind of throw him in, you know, and fly back down the Przewalski to where the batteries are. Now, at this point, I can see, and they can see, a whopping great big uh, lightning storm coming in over Wheaton. So all this spell of good weather, which, thank God, it was like that when Lindsay had his accident and when we went to get help, is now definitely altering. It's, it's spitting nasty stuff slightly further up the valley. So it means the, the helicopter anyway can't possibly go back over the range where, uh, by the same call that it came over. Anyway, they go back to where the batteries are and he closes it down again, the top, very short of fuel. Puts all Ed then helps all the lead acid batteries in, and the rest of the stuff. Does all the terminals up, and it starts. 
and this great big school bus of a thing raises off the ground and as they're going up then the pilots say okay which way are we going to go so Ed points them to Yeti Col because it's just outdoing the storm and they fly over Yeti Col and that's when I see them just as I'm starting out with the second go of the land party instead of them coming down from my right they're coming straight ahead there they are I mean that was a fantastic moment to see that because I really didn't expect it after three hours. You, you can't. You, you have to. You know. You don't have to be a particularly anxious character to expect the worst. Um, and they land at a base camp, perilously short of fuel. Um, I just jump in and give Lindsay a hug. Uh, Ed gets out to stay with me and we, we, we've got all, all these other second lot of adventurers who've come up for, for me to be going climbing with. Um, and off the helicopter goes and he stays quite low because you are down to the, the red lights and buzzers here on the fuel. And he flies, now uh, he flies, Jumble Lords 2, manages to get the 100 miles to Olgi, the post-Holocaust old coal town, and lands there the, the excuse for a hospital there is something like out to the Crimea, apparently. In order, there was no splints or anything, anything a table in this hospital. No, it wasn't really a hospital. It was a sort of first aid center. They broke a table in order to make two other splints for him. And he was there overnight, but there was no fuel. And as luck would have it, next morning, uh, there are quite a few Kazakhs, as I've said, are going back to Kazakhstan. So there's some fixed-wing aircraft, not very big, coming into an airstrip there. And in exchange for five bottles of vodka, some fuel was bought uh, to, to be siphoned from the fixed-wing air, Kazakh aircraft into the helicopter, but only enough to get to Hovd, which is where the Operation Rally thing was, another 100 miles south. But at least they could, they could wind it up again and fly the next morning to Hovd, at which point... John had ordered a Learjet. The nearest place for that to come was Hong Kong, which is 2,000 miles from Ovd. So the next day, this Learjet with Australian pilots in it, who had never been to Mongolia and thought, you know, we thought, well, you know, it must be as wild as anything, Australia, so they haven't seen anything like the bloody Gobi. Um, and they landed quite short of fuel themselves. So you won't believe this. The, 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 what was left in the helicopter was siphoned into the Learjet. You're kidding me. No. Um, and that enabled the Aussies to fly Lindsay as far as Ulaanbaatar. But they got stopped there um, by bureaucracy because Lindsay didn't have his passport, which is obviously still up at base camp. I mean, who's going to think of that at that stage? Um, and they refueled the Learjet there. And they weren't actually given clearance to fly, but flew anyway. That was pretty good. Um, and just as they were getting to Hong Kong, the last bit of that part of the story is that um, uh, there was an imminent typhoon coming in. They were the last plane to land for, you know, 36 hours or whatever. Where Lindsay went to hospital, uh, and uh, but his recuperation uh, carried on in Britain for a year um, at, at the orthopaedic hospital in in, in Oyster Street. But did you get the message up on, uh, up at camp that 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 he'd been evacuated no, successfully? We, we knew nothing of this mm -hmm. until a couple of days later, because we had that we, we had our shortwave radio, and they said just that he had left in the Learjet. Didn't know the details of the story. Ed and me slept for 17 hours on the go then. We subsequently heard that Jambald had spent a week trying to find enough fuel to fly the remaining 800 miles to Ulaanbaatar. That's an, ast it's an astonishing rescue. I mean, the things that had to come together to make that fit into place. I mean, you guys had to come up with the plan in the, in the instant. I mean, not least the levering of the boulder, the releasing of him. But then for the other parts of that jigsaw to come together successfully, he's bloody lucky to have got out of that. I have to say that John Blasher Snell had Captain Jambledorch put up for a medal. The distances he travelled, which could have been could be the longest helicopter rescue ever, because from Ulaanbaatar to Hovd to the mountain and back to Hovd and back to Ulaanbaatar is 2,000 miles return trip in an ageing helicopter. And that's got to alone be some kind of a record. So in 1993, Princess Anne made the first 
royal visit to the newly uh, independent Mongolia. And at the British Embassy in Ulaanbaatar, she gave Jambal Dorge um, the Queen's Medal for Valuable Service in the Air, which is normally given to British and Commonwealth pilots, but there was an exception made. So that was a, a, a fitting tribute to what, what he did. And, and years later, of course, nobody was looking at a bit of border like that, but years later we were told that the Chinese got wind of, I mean, it was a year later that, you know, had there been a helicopter in Chinese airspace and I think got in touch with the Mongolians. And I think they had said, uh, yeah, but it was just an injured climber, we're getting him out or something, and that was fine, you know. And nobody looked into that any further. Did it change your climate? In boulder fields, yes, because because uh, um, going, uh, not doing a Lindsay, as we, we call it now, don't go onto a boulder field and do a Lindsay. So, um, yeah, I'm, that's what I'm very wary of. And, and it's, it's strange, isn't it? Because it's pretty easy ground. You, you won't look at it and say you've got to be a great climber to go across that. Um, but it can be dangerous. And I think most people who have been on glacial moraines know that. But, you know, it's still fairly rare, but it happened. And, and Lindsay made a, a pretty good recovery, didn't he? And it took a lot of healing. I mean, at one stage they thought it might not heal. Uh, the bone might not regrow. And there were some grafts. It was a long period, but, but it came good. And he and and, and he didn't he didn't I'm, waste waste time um, getting climbing again, did he? No, I I, I see I see, uh, I see um, Lindsay quite a bit. He lives not far from me in 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 North Wales. And it's very sad that we don't have Ed with us anymore because, as, as you mentioned earlier, he sadly died last year. But he was absolutely critical in this, wasn't he? The, having the pair of you together and his his stoicism and an ability to stay calm in this situation was amazing. He, he was unbelievably sto stoical. I mean, he would remain uh, more stoical in terms of, you know, I'd, I'd be more likely to get quite anxious because that's, that, 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 that's me. So I'm sort of, I think we've complemented each other. I'm sort of good on one level. He's very good as in that kind of staid way that you need to be uh, as well. But I can tell you that there is a, a very special feeling standing on a significant mountain that's never been climbed before. And it feels different. And we do it because we love it. And you do it with friends. And climbing is an amateur thing. There's, there's some extraordinary climbers out there, two or three people going off on a trip and really keeping it low key and doing some extraordinary stuff because they love it. Jules, you're still out climbing me. I mean, I've, I've, I've got a few years on you. I'm a bit younger, but you're still um, a lot stronger, faster than I am. How, how long are you going to carry on for? David, I'm absolutely not as strong as you. You are a youngster and I'm, you know, upper 60s. It, it just gets harder and harder. Look, you have to stop at some stage, but yeah, OK, I, there'll be a time that you, you stop trying to get up to 6,000 metres and you do lots more treks and things. But I've always been interested in going to mountains um, and and hoofing up something or other. Um, God, trying to keep fit is is got to be a good thing. And frankly, if if the worst came to the worst and I got wiped out on a mountain, it would frankly be a lot better than some old folks' home. So I think I'll I'll head for the mountains. Mm -hmm.